Governor's Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act Initiative webinars. Today's webinar is titled Critical Habitat and Invasive Species. My name is Zach Bodane, I'm Policy Advisor for Wildlife and Lands at the Western Governors Association. If you're in any need of technical assistance, please be sure to message Amy Schweig through the WebEx application or call WGA at 303-623-9378. Before I introduce our moderator, I'd like to describe the Western Governor's Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act initiative and go over a few logistical details for the webinar. The Western Governor's Species Conservation and ESA initiative is the chairman's initiative of current WGA chairman, Governor Matt Mead of Wyoming. Through this initiative, we hope to create a framework for states to share best practices in species management, promote and elevate the role of states in species conservation efforts, and explore ways to improve the efficacy of the Endangered Species Act. The initiative will involve a thorough examination of the ESA to determine what's working and what isn't. The effort, however, will go beyond consideration of the ESA and examine and highlight innovations related to species management and conservation, and consider means by which state resources can be better leveraged. For a few logistical details, today we're joined by our moderator, Chuck Bonham, Director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Beyond Chuck, the panelists will each have some time to introduce themselves in just a moment. Each panelist will deliver some brief opening remarks. Following those remarks, Chuck will ask a few questions to the panelists to begin a moderated discussion. After the moderated discussion portion of the webinar amongst panelists, we'll have an open question and answer session open to all attendees. All, all general attendees are currently on mute, so please be sure to write your questions in the chat box to the bottom right, and be sure that you have direct, selected the option to address your chat question directly to me, Zach Bodain. Our goal is to have a recording of this webinar available on the WGA website, available by this Friday the 5th or early next week. Again, for any technical assistance, please message Amy Schweig through the WebEx application or call WGA at 303-623-9378. And with all that being said, I would like now to hand things over to our moderator, Chuck Bonham. Chuck? Hey, thanks, Zach, and Bill, and the rest of the folks at the Western Governors Association for uh, designing this workshop. And I took a quick scroll through the maybe 100 or so participants, and it's nice to see so many familiar names dialing in for this conversation. So Zach's right, my name's Chuck Bonham. I think I have the greatest job in the world as the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I wanted to start by just sharing a few of my personal views shaped by our experience in California, and then we'll turn to Dr. David Sweet at Trout Unlimited. So here's how I get uh, to this topic of the workshop. It's shaped in part by uh, managing one of the larger state wildlife agencies in the state. Uh, it's one of the oldest. We actually have our own California Endangered Species Act. It's been around for quite some time. There are a lot of similarities with the Federal Act. I also have the great benefit of being part of the broader Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, the Western Regional Association, and then the great honor of kind of serving with a few colleagues on the federal front, state front, in a joint task force around the Endangered Species Act. So California has more biodiversity than any state in the union, which is the measure of richness of life, but we also lead the nation in loss of biodiversity. So we, in our own state, struggle with the paradox between richness of natural life and loss of that, a population base of 38 million growing to 50 million in the foreseeable future. We have the most species, uh, I think, in the state, in the nation, and uh, one of the highest numbers of protected species. So we're in a constant um, looking down the field effort to achieve harmony and synchronicity. We engage on species conservation both with our colleagues at the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, but unlike some of our colleagues in the Intermountain West, we actually have an equal or greater engagement with the National Marine Fisheries Service. And those relationships are good, and they inform our view at our department that the Federal Endangered Species Act works well, but it can also work better. Um, 
And over the course of this conversation today, I look forward to learning from our panelists and in the questions about a couple of individual topics. First, habitat. What does it mean in the 21st century to think through conservation at a habitat level given change in our natural systems, whether we're protecting landscapes today, which may not be the ones necessary for protection in the future given climate change, how that implicates invasive species, which for California, our diversity of habitats basically means any non-native species that makes it here can actually find some form of suitable habitat somewhere in the state. And we estimate that it's costing our state about $3 billion a year dealing with the negative impacts from invasive species. And how all of that may fit together with the, to me, most important part of the Federal Endangered Species Act, which is recovery. What does it look like for a future of sustainable populations where state and federal and private and public parties are working together to achieve conservation such that we're avoiding uh, the regulatory measures that come along with listing as it may relate to our needs in given states. So I'll stop there. I look forward to the panel. I thank everybody for joining. And let's shift over to Dr. David Sweet uh, at Wyoming Trout Unlimited, who's going to kind of walk us through his work on the Yellowstone Lake special kind of focus there. So Dave, you want to take it? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Judge Wide Basis. It's been extirpated from uh, well over half of its native range by a variety of reasons. Uh, habitat degradation, uh, competition with invasive species, hybridization with other trout species, and a general warming of its historic waters. Uh, and then within the remaining 040-43% oh, of that range, it is present, but it's significantly hybridized in about a third of that range. Um, by rainbow trout, which is not a native species of this particular area. Uh, also, by way of history, it was petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act in the 1990s, but that uh, petitioning was declined uh, based primarily on some recovery and restoration efforts that were underway at the time. And of course, that all happened before uh, the lake trout situation in Yellowstone Lake. Uh, next slide, please, Chuck. Uh, this map is a, a map of both the historic range for the Yellowstone cutthroat trout shown in blue in those streams and also its current range shown in green. And for our purposes, we consider the Snake River cutthroat trout and the Yellowstone cutthroat trout to be the same species. Of course, that's subject to some debate. Uh, but we consider them to be the same species. Um, and you'll notice right in the center of that particular map, there's a large green area, which is both historic and current range. That's the Yellowstone Lake system that I want to focus in on. Uh, next slide, if you would, please. Uh, talking about that particular population, uh, the Yellowstone Lake population of the Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout, at one time, it numbered about 4 million, and that's as recent as about the 1970s. And uh, at that time, it was the most significant remaining genetically pure population found anywhere within that historic range. And it was thought to be secure, of course, due to the status of the lands um, uh, where they occupied, that being National Park Service lands. Uh, it was absolutely protected from development. It was very high elevation and sharing of cold water. Uh, so that the impacts of climate change were thought to be fairly minor. There was a total lack of competing species in that system. In fact, there were no rainbow trout in that entire upper uh, Yellowstone River, Yellowstone Lake system, and it was totally isolated by Yellowstone Falls, making upward migration of rainbows uh, essentially impossible. However, uh, sometime in the 1980s, uh, it's not known exactly when, Lake trout were illegally introduced into that system, 
And as a result, the population declined to about 5 to 10 percent of its former level by 2008. And of course, the, uh, the uh, actual implication of the lake trout is that they simply eat the cutthroat and were consuming them by large numbers. And there were no other prey species in that system. So uh, it was a very, very significant impact on the population. Next slide, please. We're not just talking about a uh, loss of a single species, and I think this is pretty characteristic uh, anywhere you have an invasive sp uh, species that's introduced. It's not just the direct impact of the loss of that species. Uh, in the Yellowstone Lake uh, situation, there were many other species that uh, preyed upon the Yellowstone cutthroat and counted on them for part of their diet. Uh, some major predators like uh, grizzly bears and black bears, of course river otters, and many, many birds of prey like bald eagles and ospreys and, and other birds. Uh, in fact, there were about 40 species altogether that, that suffered directly due to the decline of the Yellowstone cutthroat trout, and there were very likely some secondary impacts as well. Uh, that we may have a chance to talk about later. Next slide. Uh, the economic impacts, um, you know, the direct loss of the sport fishing, and of course it was a major sport fishing industry surrounding Yellowstone Lake and the upper Yellowstone River, that was estimated back in the 1990s at about 36 million annually. Uh, in addition to that, there were a number of impacts that were not included, uh, losses to the outfitting industry primarily uh, outside the park, but some within the park as well in the fishing outfitting industry. Uh, and then there were a number of impacts to general tourism and their experiences. Um, as shown there on the right, that's Fishing Bridge uh, back in the day when people could still fish from Fishing Bridge. But even more recently, tourists would uh, flock to that area to, to watch those Yellowstone cutthroat trout on their migration movements. Uh, in the Yellowstone River and down by Lahardy Rapids. And so it's oftentimes very difficult to estimate those economic impacts to general tourism and certainly Yellowstone National Park being a major tourism destination. Next slide. Well, what's being done about this situation? I won't go through many of the details, uh, but suffice it to say it was a two-pronged effort that we'll probably have a chance to talk about a little bit more later. The primary uh, method to control the numbers of lake trout is netting operation conducted by the National Park Service, both gill netting and trap netting, to have a direct impact on that population just through direct removal. But the secondary study, and one that I've been involved in preliminary, or primarily, is a telemetry study uh, with lake trout and planting them with hydroacoustic tags to try to identify um, the lake trout spawning areas as well as their general movement patterns. And it, the hope was that science would then allow us to concentrate on alternative suppression of the ova and the fry. And the next slide. Just a little bit of results. Again, I won't go into much detail, but uh, uh, through these efforts, the lake trout numbers are now about half of what they were just four years ago. Certainly, we have not achieved success. Uh, but we are on our way to that success. Lake trout numbers are declining. Cutthroat numbers are about triple what they were just four years ago. And, and most heartening is the survival of, uh, of juvenile Yellowstone cutthroat trout, which uh, four years ago were not surviving at all due to predation. And the next slide. Uh, who's paying for this effort? And we'll get into the finances, I think, late, later in the question session. But uh, Park Service spends roughly a million dollars annually for the netting and some scientific studies. That's supplemented by a second million dollars annually that the Yellowstone Park Foundation contributes to the netting. And then those of us in the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, uh, and the USGS spent about another third of a million dollars annually for the telemetry and overpriced studies. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, especially since Governor Mead is the chairman, um, that the majority of that money does come from the Wyoming Wildlife and Natural Resource Trust grant, which is a conservation fund set up by our state to assist in conservation efforts. And they were very gracious in contributing significantly. 
And I believe the last slide is the next one. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that lake trout are a problem uh, many places in the Rocky Mountain West. Uh, in fact, uh, there are at least 14 major systems in the West where non-native lake trout are preying on native or popular sport fish and are considered problematic by those who, uh, who study those systems, and just a few of those are listed there. And with that, I think I'll end my introductory comments, and we may talk more about some specifics later. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, thank you, David. And uh, hats off to you for your volunteerism, which is a fundamental ingredient of what makes America great and is definitely in the conservation field. So let's turn to Matt Morrison, who is our chief executive officer for the Pacific Northwest economic region, and I believe Matt will give us a regional view of the challenges around invasive species from his perspective. Matt? Yeah, thanks very much, Chuck. Um, PENWAR, we call it, is a unique uh, binational organization that takes in five states and five Canadian jurisdictions, three provinces, two territories. Uh, next slide. Uh, our concern here is with quagga zebra mussels that have been marching across the country uh, from an introduction in the mid-80s from the uh, Eastern European uh, countries through uh, ballast water in the Great Lakes. And um, they now uh, are in every state except the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> and we hope to somehow keep them out. But uh, uh, recently the state of Washington uh, asked us to do a, a study on economic impacts uh, should the quagga zebras come into the region. And uh, looking at that, uh, the uh, figure was a half a billion a year for the rest of our lives um, because of its impact in hydroelectric facilities, uh, all kinds of water systems, irrigation, um, fish hatcheries, and uh, all of our freshwater systems. Uh, next slide. So uh, these are very small. They're the size of your little fingernail, and, and each one can produce a million villagers a year, uh, a million babies that swim around, and, and they attach themselves to uh, any kind of uh, hard object. In the Great Lakes, they've seriously impacted uh, fisheries. Um, and uh, there are negative impacts uh, linked to walleye, whitefish, alewives, bluegill, Chinook salmon fisheries. Um, and we're very concerned about the potential impacts uh, here. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, this shows uh, just the, the recent um, this is since 1991, um, where uh, both zebra and quaggas are found. Uh, for the, the Pacific Northwest states, the, the greatest uh, threat comes from the lower Colorado River system, uh, in particular Lake Mead. Um, next slide. You can see where, uh, you know, our uh, recreational boats uh, come from, and um, we are doing our best to coordinate watercraft inspection stations, um, but there are serious issues in trying to develop a perimeter strategy. Um, I think it's, it's notable that uh, the Western uh, aquatic invasive species uh, has worked on preventing the spread of aquatic invasives by uh, developing model legislation uh, for watercraft inspection stations and decontamination programs. And, and their report uh, is, is a great resource for states looking at uh, collaborating uh, between states and the federal government as well. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, um, these things are, are very seriously impacting uh, not only uh, fish stocks, but our agriculture and hydroelectric facilities. 
I think that our, our report really highlights that the most important thing we need is more decontamination at the source. And as a matter of policy, Department of Interior and National Park Service need to require the implementation of mandatory inspections and decontamination at watercraft before leaving federally and interjurisdictional waters of the lower Columbia. And that's been called for since 2007 by the National Park Service Mussel Infestation Prevention and Response Planning Guide and the Quagga Zebra Mussel Action Plan of 2010. So uh, we know that where they're coming from and it, uh, rather than having inspection stations at a thousand lakes and rivers, there are only seven boat launches on Lake Mead. We would like to see every single one of them require uh, inspections and decontamination of watercraft coming out of there. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, from Hoover Dam. It's just uh, uh, what uh, these things do to intakes on hydroelectric facilities and also any water system. They've they've shut down Ford plants in the in uh, Michigan and um, they have very serious impacts. Um, we're concerned about them for our salmon and uh, the fish weir systems at the dams that allow uh, young salmon to return uh, to the ocean. Next slide. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, uh, I know Southern Cal Edison is spending $40 million a year just to deal with them and they have never been eradicated. It's just not an option. Um, so uh, once you have them, you have them. Next slide. So our whole push has been to really look at the governance of, you know, if if this is going to cost us a half a billion dollars a year forever, uh, where are the resources to deal with this issue and try to prevent uh, the spread of these invasives? And um, you know, currently we are working with uh, our congressional delegation. We have a, a four million dollar appropriation in in the Water Resources Development Act uh, through the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and this is a new program we're hoping will double the four states' efforts in the Columbia River Basin. Uh, next slide. Um, so our key recommendations really are, uh, number one, um, we need a, a coordinated approach to stop these at the source. Uh, it's much easier to find them where we know we have infected lakes and rivers. Uh, the second, we have no significant long-term funding and um, for prevention, and this is absolutely necessary. Uh, we want real-time information sharing among the states uh, with watercraft inspection stations. Um, we'd like to be able to share resources across the region on a regional multi-state basis and engage all the at-risk stakeholders. We need the, um, the sport fishing community. We need the boat builders involved. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, work going on, but a lot more needs to be done. Um, and then we currently don't really have an, a regional coordination entity. Uh, we're working with the Corps of Engineers to, to try to put that together. Uh, next slide. Uh, in the Columbia River Basin, uh, we know we've done the studies that uh, we have a high calcium concentrate and it's just ideal for these kinds of uh, invasives. And um, with 60 hydropower facilities in the basin, uh, it would seriously impact uh, all of them. Next slide. So this is my last slide. We recently had a, I, I mean, our, the region I represent includes Canada and Manitoba came to say, oh, why didn't we listen to you? You know, it, we could have spent two million a year preventing this and now we're spending 20 million this year and we're never going to get rid of it. Um, so 
they uh, attended a conference they had last month and, and just urged the other states and provinces to take this seriously because uh, they tried uh, eradicating it from Lake Winnipeg, a, a huge lake in Manitoba, uh, but was unsuccessful. So there's, there's no known way of eradicating mussels, um, but uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done among states, uh, federal agencies, and uh, local jurisdictions to, to have a rapid response plan and to look at how this might be contained. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thanks, Matt. And I suspect that the presence of these mussels in California is only making your anxiety and challenges worse for the Pacific Northwest. And as most folks know, they're filter feeders, so they consume large quantities of phytoplankton. And what we're seeing in some of our state is once their um, presence arrives in a water body, that consumption of phytoplankton can result in the, you know, kind of complete disruption of the ecological balance of the entire water body. So let's shift now to our last uh, panelist presenter, uh, Mr. Chris Crookshanks uh, with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And I believe Chris is in the department's native aquatics um, uh, program and he's a staff specialist. So Chris, uh, welcome and we look forward to your five minutes so presentation. Thanks Chuck, I appreciate it. Uh, I just want to give a quick uh, update background and uh, just to uh, let folks know uh, about Lahontan cutthroat trout recovery in Nevada, uh, what we've done in the past, a little bit of history, and where we're going in the future. Next slide please. So for background, the Lawton cutthroat trout in Nevada was originally listed as an endangered species in 1970. It was then reclassified as threatened in 1975. Uh, currently, uh, all recovery actions for LCT in Nevada are guided by the LCT recovery plan, which was uh, finalized in 1995. In Nevada, there are currently three geographic management units for Lahontan cutthroat trout. Uh, this includes the Northwest GMU, Humboldt GMU, and Western GMU. So we'll take a look at those uh, geographic management units. Next slide, please. Here's a map uh, depicting historic occurrence of Lawton cutthroat trout in Nevada. On the east, you've got the uh, Humboldt GMU, uh, which encompasses much of the Humboldt River system. The Northwest GMU, which is uh, sort of purple colored, encompasses uh, Quinn and Black Rock and the Western GMU. Um, the Western G what, what you see on this map is, you can, it appears there, there to be a lot of connectivity to the blue lines represent historic occurrence of Lahontan cutthroat trout in Nevada, whereas the yellow lines signify uh, current. The map is a little bit out of dated. You can see Walker Lake down there in the western GMU. LCT were extirpated from Walker Lake a number of years ago. And it does appear that there's a lot of connectivity in LCT, but most current LCT populations in Nevada are relocated to, to high mountain streams uh, a lot of the streams, once they reach the valley bottom, are either diverted or they become thermal limited and cutthroat just can't survive there. Next slide, please. We have some, some major differences in, in management and recovery of LCT within our GMUs. So looking first at both the, the Humboldt and the Northwest GMUs, uh, Lahontan cutthroat trout in, in these areas are characterized largely by the fluvial life form. They're found, uh, like I said, in, in generally isolated high elevation streams fed by snowmelt runoff. Uh, generally speaking, uh, very limited metapopulation potential. Our recovery actions in both the Humboldt and the Northwest GMUs are guided by the 1995 recovery plan, like I mentioned, state species management plans and goals that have been established by respective GMU teams. And I will say that the primary recovery efforts in Nevada, at least uh, by the states, Oregon and Nevada, are currently focused on, on these two GMUs. 
Next slide, please. So moving over to, to the Western GMU, uh, it's significantly different than both the Humboldt and the Northwest GMUs. There is some existing potential fluvial populations and that do exist, uh, but the Western GMU is characterized by a number of lacustrine populations such as Pyramid Lake, Lake Tahoe, which currently does not have LCT in it, and Independence Lake. And uh, the recovery actions in the Western GMU are guided by recovery implement implementation teams. And we have RIT teams for the Carson, Walker, Truckee, and Tahoe Basins. Next slide, please. Primary threats that we deal with in Nevada to LCT, our, our biggest one are non-native salmonids. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit later today about invasive species. We don't consider non-native Salmonids as invasive species in Nevada, uh, but they do pose some, some very significant threats and challenges to LCT recovery. Primarily, uh, the non-native salmonids we're dealing with are uh, rainbow trout, which hybridize readily with, with lawn and cutthroat trout, uh, brown trout, and brook trout. And uh, brown trout and brook trout readily compete with, with LCT. Other threats to our LCT populations are, are water diversions, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago. A lot of these, these streams are high elevation. Once, we, once they reach the valley bottom, uh, they're diverted for irrigation purposes in, in a number of instances. Habitat degradation um, from a number of sources, ungulate, ungulate use being one of them. And when I say ungulates, we're not just talking about cattle. Uh, we've got a, a huge problem in Nevada with feral horses and also, uh, Stochastic events such as fire and drought pose, pose huge threats to LCT. Uh, we're having a good winter. Currently right now we're sitting at about 130% uh, precipitation wise, but uh, this is coming out of the past four years, which is the most significant drought in the history of the state. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk really quickly about our, our recovery protocols uh, for our LCT streams in Nevada. Like I said, most of our recovery actions occur in the Humboldt and Northwest GMUs, um, these high mountain streams. And, and what we do in these localities is we'll go in and conduct uh, extensive pretreatment habitat and population surveys uh, to see what's there. Uh, I do want to mention that safe harbor agreements have been a huge factor for LCT recovery in Nevada. Um, having willing private landowners uh, sign these agreements has been, it been a huge, huge boon for, for recovery. Um, so if we have a safe harbor agreement in place, that's, that's, a, that's a huge uh, positive factor. We'll generally, um, we'll generally uh, install temporary management barriers uh, to keep uh, upstream populations away from, from non-native species downstream. Uh, once a temporary barrier is, is in place, we'll then conduct a chemical treatment. Uh, what we do in Nevada is usually a two-day chemical treatment uh, to eradicate non-native salmonids. Once that is done, we'll do conduct a, a number of post-treatment evaluations, and if those evaluations prove that the, the eradication project was a success, we'll come back in and reintroduce lawn and cutthroat trout. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the keys to the success of LCT recovery in Nevada, um, like I just mentioned, safe harbor agreements. Anytime that we can get landowner uh, participation and cooperation, uh, it's been a huge, huge factor for success in cutthroat recovery. Uh, obviously, cooperation with our partners, the BLM, U.S. Forest Service, our land management agencies, uh, tribes, uh, it doesn't say it on here, but also some of our NGOs, specifically Trout Unlimited, has played a huge role in the success, in the success of cutthroat recovery. Uh, constant coordination with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and quite simply learning from a lot of our past mistakes. We've been conducting lawn and cutthroat trout stream recovery projects for 30 to 40 years in Nevada at the least, and uh, there's been a, a huge learning curve um, and I think that we've really refined our techniques in what we use 
and how we use it for, for recovery in Nevada. So with that, that's just a, a quick overview on some of our recovery efforts, and uh, that's about all I have. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris, to you and your director, Tony, for leadership. That's a captivating and compelling story about <clears throat> You know what we are all seeking in conservation. You know, implementing a recovery effort to get back to sustainable populations. Hey, so here's the game plan, everybody. We're going to take. We're running about five-ish minutes behind, but we're going to take about 30 minutes. I'm going to moderate a discussion with our three uh, presenters. We have a set of questions. I'm going to start big. You know, at uh, goals and ideals around conservation, and then we're going to move into some specifics around critical habitat invasives how you actually do this in the field, best practices. We're going to save about 20 minutes for questions from, I grew up in the South, so all y'all is the plural of y'all. So questions from all y'all. Uh, I remind you to log your question with Zach uh, in the chat function. I only see one or so now. So let, let's get started. And Chris, your, your presentation, uh, a, a phrase you used really struck home for me, which was this idea of structuring a recovery effort around geographic management units, right? So you or the, the other folks on our panel, how do you deal with this? And I'm struggling with it. So, you know, an, an area we may view geographically as ideal habitat today, you know, may not even be adequate habitat tomorrow. And then you factor in changing environmental conditions and a segue between our last governor's initiative, Governor Sandoval on drought, into the current one on, you know, endangered species, Governor Mead, you get drought, you get climate change, you get development, which appears to be accelerating habitat type differences. How, how do you deal with a shift over time in conservation where your habitats may be changing? That's a real good question. I think uh, that the, the shift over time uh, has been really displayed uh, just in, in the past four years, we've had extreme drought conditions in Nevada, um, and we've seen, you know, sort of sort of the loss of habitat in Lahontan and Cutthroat Trap streams uh, extremely accelerated just in the past past four years. So it's really um, moved to the forefront. How do we deal with with habitat changes over time? Um, when you when you look at historic habitat versus currently occupied habitat, you know, it, it's interesting to, where do you take that snapshot of what was, what was currently, or what was historically occupied versus currently occupied? Um, you know, the, the, these high mountain isolated streams uh, obviously were all part of ancient Lake Lahontan at one point in time, um, as, as Lake Lahontan desiccated you know, lawn and cutthroat trout were, were relegated to these upper reaches of streams. So it, it's an interesting question to, to pose. Um, what snapshot in time do you take for, for recovery? Um, looking at that, you know, in, in a present sense, but looking in, into the future, um, and I, I think that that is in a very unique situation in the fact that we are the driest state in the union. I think, um, you know, any, any sort of drought exasperates what we have, which is, which is little to begin with. So um, it, is, it is a really interesting question to pose on, um, you know, look at, looking in the face of, of climate change. You know, just in the past four years, we've seen a number of, of historical populations of Lawton cutthroat trout blink out in Nevada. So um, there's some very, very serious considerations to, to keep in mind. So. Let's, let's go from, unless uh, Dave or Matt, you want to add anything on this idea of you know, shift over time relative to habitat. Uh, I'm, I'm curious y'all's thinking on, so let, let's connect habitat to, which is a, from where I said, a fundamental ingredient for conservation and time scale change to, you know, broad landscapes. And Matt, you, you used a phrase that really struck me in your fight against invasive species around regional coordination. So, so if we're talking about habitat, we're talking about particularly these, some highly migratory species which, you know, may not know 
political boundaries, and then you layer in invasive species, which definitely don't respect political boundaries. Matt, what does it look like to build on regional coordination where you sit from managing invasive species? What does that mean when you say regional coordination? Thanks, uh, Chuck. Well, I think, um, you know, uh, each state has their programs, but um, we're trying, in this case, with quagga zebras, develop an effective perimeter strategy to keep the mussels out of the region and the region's watersheds. Um, we think that that's the most cost-effective thing to do, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're having a hard time with the federal government. Um, for example, we'd, we'd like to aggregate state match for this federal program, and even some of the western states would be happy to have better inspection stations on their eastern flank in Montana or even Wyoming. Um, but we don't have a mechanism to do that. Uh, so I think it's, it's very important to really look at um, a regional uh, coordination strategy. And, and some, yeah. Go ahead. No, there just there needs to be more mechanisms to to actually achieve that on the ground. Mm -hmm. Do you think regional coordination, either as to prevention or, Chris, David, in your experience, you know, conservation and recovery, looking across a broad landscape, is different for aquatic species than terrestrial species, or about the same? I know my experience here in California, this interface between habitat and invasive species uh, really begs this question. Um, we, you know, we have designated broad swaths of landscapes in the state for aquatic species, and the bigger the habitat area we're trying to manage, the more likely we are to be managing a habitat which includes invasive species, right? And when there are aquatic species involved, they're moving through these waterways, and you know, frankly, we've got a predation problem, and then we run into a management tool problem of, well, is your strategy simply eradication, and how does that work across a large landscape area? Uh, David, I don't, I don't know if you want to comment on this, this challenge management-wise of dealing with eradication as a particular tool. Well, well, thanks, Chuck. You know, eradication uh, is is a term that we we rarely use, uh, especially when we're talking about lake trout. Um, we use suppression as our term. You know, eradication is essentially impossible. I, I think Matt talked about that with zebra and quagga mussels. Once you've got them, you've got them. Uh, the same is probably true with lake trout. Um, you know, you can take isolated systems, high water or high uh, watershed systems, and use various uh, treatments that I think uh, Chris talked about, and use of rotenone and so on, to totally remove every every gill-breathing uh, creature in that particular watershed, and then restock it. But of course, that's impossible in a system as large as Yellowstone Lake certainly impossible when you're talking about muscles and so on. So we don't use the term eradication. Um, we use the term suppression, which allows us, or at least we hope it will allow us to drive a population uh, of the lake trout low enough so that the cutthroat have a, uh, a chance to survive and, and repopulate to a meaningful level. Um, you know, if you look at across broad landscapes, um, that becomes even more difficult, of course. Mm -hmm. Hey, does the idea of the term of art in your mind being suppression rather than eradication logically mean there may be some places where you will never be able to stop the, the invasive species, at least presence? Um, you know, Matt, I, I picked up a little bit in some of your commentary that you may may view this as once you've got them, you need to accept the fact you're always going to have them, therefore you should <clears throat> come down on uh, prevention to begin with. 
Well, we certainly have, you know, are looking at rapid response and how, how we would deal with uh, one lake or one river system to try to keep it from spreading out of that lake. Um, lake Winnipeg, they, they put um, potash on five bays and had a, a significant die off of the mussels, but, but the villagers were already in the rest of the lake, so it didn't really work. Um, but it, it's very important, I think, for states to look at um, how they're addressing a rapid response with these kinds. I think the quagga zebras are, are the most uh, costly invasive in, in the U.S. history. Yes. Um, so it's a significant thing. Well, I, I know here in California, we're here is a fear we have. So we have these mussels in the state. We don't yet have them uh, risking. The Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe, we also don't yet have them really risking the federal water project in the state, nor the state water project, but you know, it's a reasonable scenario to worry about that they could infect those systems which supply water to, you know, 28 million people. So, hey, given one of the core objectives of Governor Meade's uh, initiative is to think through, discuss best practices and innovations. Do you all see any best practices in, um, Matt, you used the phrase first response, you know, when you begin to see invasives in a waterway or on a landscape, what you do at that first responder level? Do you see a set of best practices in that field? Well, definitely at uh, westernais.org their new report on uh, uh, legislation allowing states to have uh, reciprocity on decontamination programs is excellent. So that's a best practice, and, and we need to pay attention to that. Chris or David, any thoughts on that? This is Chris. I wanted to, to back up just uh, Real quickly, uh, talking about Lawton and cutthroat trout and, and, and recovery, and, and somebody mentioned Lake Tahoe. Um, being the driest state in the union um, has some obvious disadvantages and advantages. Uh, like I was talking about, our, our recovery efforts are mainly focused on isolated high mountain streams. Um, we, one of the waters uh, within historical range for Lawton cutthroat trout is Lake Tahoe, uh, but we do realize Lake Tahoe is is so big; it's full of uh, lake trout. We realize that you know we will never ever achieve recovery of Lawton cutthroat trout in Lake Tahoe. It's just it's not feasible. It's not a possibility. Um, and as far as quaggas are concerned to Lake Tahoe, uh, there's a huge effort uh, currently going on at all the boat ramps around Lake Tahoe. Any boat going in, coming out of Lake Tahoe has to be, has to be certified. Um, I know that's, you know, living, living locally here just right next to Lake Tahoe, that's a, that's a huge fear and, and quaggas pose a huge threat because there are a num number of people uh, that do recreational boat on the Colorado system that come up here and, and put their boat on, on Lake Tahoe. So it is, it is a huge threat and there's, there's quite a bit being done to prevent their introduction into Lake Tahoe. I just wanted to say that real quick. Okay, let's, let's, let's go back again to this idea of region and uh, particularly habitat. Uh, Dave, you, you work in you know, arguably one of the continent's most um, remarkable ecosystems. Chris, I'd be curious your view as well. So well, another theme of this initiative is to explore innovations. And, and I know from my experience in California, if we get wrapped up in, uh, you know, too much energy and uh, us against them, uh, fight either whether that's between you know the state and our colleagues on the federal front or what a lot of people seek to foster which is a tension between a regulator like my department and the regulated community you know all of our creativity goes over to that tension 
And Chris, you mentioned previously your experience with safe harbors being an essential ingredient to success here. How, how do you do more with this idea of collaboration against the backdrop of a lot of things external parties seek to push us and agency towards, which is conflict? How do you foster a space where you can look across habitat, right, and then seek to forge this kind of dialogue that will spark innovation? And what does it look like to, to figure out which habitats you want to focus on? How do you know those are the ones to focus on to then begin constructing something like a safe harbor? I believe a lot of it, it has to do when, when you're looking at which habitat, to, you know, where do, where do we want to um, expend our recovery efforts, a lot of it is, is the low-hanging fruit, what's available, what, what can we accomplish. And at the basic core of recovery for Lahontan cutthroat trout in Nevada, it, it all boils down to relationships, um, relationships with your federal partners, relationships with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and relationships with, with some of your private landowners. Um, at the basic core, it, it, it's about human interactions and relationships, and we've developed some, some really wonderful partnerships and relationships with our federal partners, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the BLM, the Forest Service, which has led to some, some really great uh, recovery efforts. Um, other places, not so much, but uh, you know, we are in Nevada, and, and we are one of the last bastions of, of, of the huge anti-government movement. But what we found is if you get on the ground with some of these private landowners, um, explain what you're doing, how it benefits them and their land, we've got just in recent years uh, really good buy-in from some of our, our private landowners. And, and up, up there in the Humboldt system, we've been able to, to sign a number of safe harbor agreements and really accomplish uh, some feats in recovery of cutthroat that we would have thought would be impossible just 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sense of place that all our different constituencies bring uh, is real, and I've had the same experience. When you can walk land together, you know, you're starting to build that kind of relationship. It sounds to me that you'd view that lesson in innovation and almost actually like an essential best practice uh, for success here. Hey, so Dave, I got a, I got a question for you. It might be a little unfair. It's definitely not on our script. Hey, so I, I'm relatively new to government, and you, you know, were helpful in articulating for us. You come to your management challenge in the Yellowstone ecosystem as a volunteer. You know, not paid staff of an NGO, not a government. What's a piece of advice you'd offer to all of us on the phone that you've seen, hey, just if you thought about this, you really could shift a discussion or open up a new space for conservation. Um, you know, sometimes those not in government have a fresh set of eyes on these things. What's the piece of advice you might offer? Well, well thank you, uh, Chuck. I, I think you kind of touched on something that's, that's really important to me at least, and I, I think it's important in many of these situations. And, and, and Chris hit on it a little bit when he was talking about how you have to establish relationships. Um, you know, if you go back in time, I, I think that the NGOs around Yellowstone National Park um, perhaps didn't always have the best relationship um, with the Park Service, uh, in particular over their fisheries issues. And there was conflict and and finger pointing and, and all of those things that go with it. Um, but the one piece of advice it really came out of an administration change that happened in Yellowstone National Park about uh, eight, well, seven years ago now, I guess. Um, the, the new administration really welcomed uh, external input. And that was, I, I don't want to say it's rare, but it's probably not the norm. Um, and in particular, those of us who had a deep passion for not just the fishery, but the ecosystem in, as a whole were welcomed into the discussion. And I think that really opened up some new avenues of uh, understanding about what the, the public was perceiving 
is happening on federal lands. I think it opened up new avenues in terms of opportunities for fundraising to attack some of the uh, the particular issues uh, going on with fisheries and the aquatic and bay suits in the park. Um, and, and really set the stage for, I think, tremendous progress uh, on the issue. Um, not that the Park Service wouldn't have made progress on their own, I think they would have, but I think this really uh, gave them more support from the general public, um, reduced the barriers of us versus them, if you will. Um, so I think if I were going to offer any bit of advice to federal land managers is to be more receptive. And I know oftentimes the federal land managers go through formal uh, public comment periods on their actions, but, but those are oftentimes pretty sterile. I, I think that more can be done by actually inviting uh, interested parties to sit down in a non-threatening environment and discuss what could be done and, and what the financial implications are of taking some of those actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Hey Matt, um, let me let me push a little, and it's a uh, you know it's purposefully kind of a mutually exclusive kind of question just to provoke conversation. So you're looking across your region. Uh, you are tracking what's going on at an even more localized level within the region. I'm assuming you've also got an eye nationally on invasive species. What do you think? Do you think the best strategy is bottom up? You know, each region's working to take care of itself or each watershed and it's simply bottom up or is there a only top down strategy where some broadest possible suite of actions are pushed down or is it a hybrid of both? The pun no intended hybrid. Yeah, no, definitely a, a hybrid because it's a shared responsibility. And one of the challenges with the quagga zebras is the the biggest beneficiaries are not right now paying. They're not at the table paying for prevention. The utilities, the public utilities, the irrigation districts, the agricultural, uh, you know. So we're we're currently taxing the boat license and fishing licenses for all of our um, prevention effort. And what we need is a better governance system that enables and encourages beneficiaries throughout the ecosystem to contribute to the solution. Hey, so I'm with you on this, this spirit of beneficiary pays, but Look, you know, it's hard to open people's wallets. What have you found to be an important theme or way to talk about beneficiary pays that's really illuminated for some folks? They have a vested interest and need to be part of the fiscal solution as well. Well, with the utility commissions, we've had meetings with our legislators and they have agreed if one utility controls an entire watershed, it's the same as trimming the trees to avoid a greater cost during an ice storm that they could prevent quagga zebra mussels. Um, the problem is not too many utilities actually uh, control or monitor and manage an entire watershed. Uh, there's one example in Washington State where that's working. Uh, but um, the, the other, of course, is the Bonneville Power Administration and the entire Columbia River system which uh, does have, I think, a shared responsibility, but hasn't come to the table in, in the way I would like them to. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the federal government. Uh, we definitely feel that national, uh, there's a national re responsibility on federal lands to prevent the spread of, of aquatic invasives. So just for time check for everybody, you know, we're. Maybe we've got time for one one more question or so, and then we'll we'll run right into our Q and A session with all y'all. And I'm only seeing maybe a less than a handful of questions. So, you know, heads up if folks want to engage via chat function with Zach. So, Chris, maybe this is you to start, but everybody, 
help me understand uh, how to think through a re the relationship. So on one hand, we know invasive species uh, can threaten uh, protected species, right? And on another hand, we know ecologically species sustainability relates to you know, time and space, quality of habitat. What, how, do you, how do you square the corners of looking at a habitat you're trying to conserve for protected species, knowing it either currently has you know, presence of invasive species, which are a limiting factor to the very protected animal, or it could have invasive species in the future, all kind of in this context of you know, animals being designated for protection under a federal you know, Endangered Species Act. Any thoughts there? I think as, as far as, you know, there, there's sort of some, some semantics uh, when we're talking about invasive species versus non-native species control. You know, when we're, when we're talking about invasive species, specifically we've been, we've been discussing quagga mussels, but there's, there's all sorts of other invasive species out there on the l landscape that we really should be aware of. Uh, you know, quagga mussels, Quagga mussels obviously pose pose a huge threat to you know to the entire western United States. There's also critters out there in the landscape uh, like bullfrogs and crayfish, uh, which can do you know just just as much damage to some of our our native aquatic populations and species. Um, granted, they're not they're not going to destroy you know huge waterways, but they can have a significant effect on native fish and, and native amphibians. Um, and like was discussed earlier, I, I think the, the key is containment and control of, of some of these invasive species. We realize we're never going to get rid of quaggas, like was discussed earlier. We're never going to get rid of bullfrogs in the western U.S. or some of our invasive crayfish species. But the key is, is containment and control. And, and another thing I wanted to discuss was, you know, when, when quaggas were first discovered in Lake Mead, what everybody out there on the landscape wanted to do was was quickly find a silver bullet, find find something that would eat them, with that that would control them, and and I think caution should be exercised when trying to identify a silver bullet for the control of of an invasive species. Um, as we've you know learned in the past, a lot of times you know. Your silver bullet might not be as silver as you once thought when you when you introduce it. So I want to caution against introducing another non-native species to control an invasive species because today's introduced species could be tomorrow's invasive species. Does that make sense? It does, and I'm with you on this challenge in the fee in this area of terminology and. How, how people come with, you know, bias might not be the right word, but experience around terminology and then how that terminology is used in this kind of management area, which allows me kind of to pivot into a, a form of one of our first questions kind of coming from the attendees. And I'll, I'll make it personal and see if any of you all want to take it farther. <laughs> so, you know, we have a, we have a, a delta, Bay Delta system in California where our two biggest rivers kind of crash together and it's also interfacing with the estuary influence coming in through the San Francisco Bay. And, you know, it's a migratory pathway for pretty highly imperiled salmon species. And we also have a very robust port fishery on, you know, fish that, have, that are introduced, they're not here you know, historically, uh, striped bass is a good example, but they've now been here 100 plus years, and we have a very tense discussion underway between, w is it possible to draw a line? What is native, non-native? What is game? What is there a historical reluctance for a management agency like mine um, to think about viewing a game species as an invasive species and I don't have a, an, an easy answer here. I think it's a, it's a mashup of these different orientations, constituency views, uh, and it remains a persistent management 
debate in this state that's pretty active. I don't know if y'all want to comment on that, but we get a question like that coming from our attendees as we're moving into that part of this agenda. Chuck, uh, this is Dave. I, I would love to comment on that. I, I, we face that all the time when we talk about uh, Yellowstone National Park and the various uh, fisheries that exist within the border of that park. Uh, historically, of course, the park was was predominantly a Yellowstone cutthroat trout uh, natural range with a little bit of west slope cutthroat on the far western edge and some fluvial arctic grayling. And uh, uh, now through introduction by park management uh, over the decades, we have rainbow trout, we have brown trout, we have brook trout, as well as, as the cutthroat trout species. And, and any time there's consideration of uh, trying to take one of those systems and revert it back to a Yellowstone cutthroat trout fishery, especially if the, the species is totally extirpated from that system, there's a huge pushback um, from angling community in particular who enjoys that non-native species who truly is an invasive, but, but a man-introduced invasive. Uh, and it's not an easy question, and, and there are those times when the management decisions uh, simply uh, go to the will of the public, um, and, uh, and we're faced with that in Yellowstone National Park. There are other systems where the public doesn't have as much opinion and, and we try to reestablish native species in those ranges. But uh, the, the will of the public does become very important and in, in, in that I think it behooves the rest of us to try and educate the public as much as we can about the importance of the native species and the threats that it is under in its entire range. So there is a big educational component there as well. Hey, just forewarning for all the attendees, I can I can see who's attending. I know many of you, if you're not asking questions, I'll be calling you immediately after this and haranguing you for why you didn't ask questions. Joking. Uh, here's another, it's kind of a taking one of the questions we have in the queue and kind of translating it. <clears throat> There's another challenge, I, I at least uh, see my department struggling with here in California where we, we do get this mashup of, of many different species, some who've been here forever, some for a while, some relatively new. I mean, ecologically speaking, predation happens, right? So how do you sort through predation that's part of a natural system, predation which may be a limiting factor in the sense of recovering a listed species? Um, how, how do you draw lines there, and not lines in the sense of uh, battle, but rather, Chris, in the sense of just structuring your recovery strategy, knowing you've got limited capacity at an agency and you need to put your capacity on your highest priorities. Any, any thoughts in that, that, that area? I think there are some, some very unique challenges when you're dealing um, you know, a lot of people want to look at um, and introduce an exotic species um, predating on, um, you know, a native species. And, and in terms of lot and cutthroat trout, that's what we see is, is rainbow trout and brook trout and brown trout and, and lake trout. They were all introduced species that, that readily predate upon uh, lot and cutthroat trout. But we've had some, some similar situations in Nevada, uh, one of them from not too long ago is a uh, endangered species in, in central Nevada, one of our spine day species, was being heavily predated upon by cormorants. Um, not only a native species, but one that's, that's federally protected under the Migratory Bird Act. And we face some um, extremely difficult, difficult challenges in trying to alleviate that predation by the cormorants on our, on our spine days, and it took uh, a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to, to 
alleviate those problems from cormorants. So I think there are some, some unique situations out there. Another one that, that immediately comes to mind is uh, predation uh, by ravens on sage grouse eggs in particular. Granted, sage grouse, um, we subverted the listing on sage grouse, uh, but that's a huge problem across the West is, is predation upon sage grouse eggs by ravens. Well, Chuck, this is Dave. Uh, I think if I read the question right on the Q&A there, um, uh, it was asked specifically about the impact of pelicans on Yellowstone cutthroat trout and in some of the historic range of Yellowstone cutthroat trout. And the, the person who asked the question is absolutely right. I mean, the pelican uh, historically was a, a huge predator on Yellowstone cutthroat trout, yet even with that predation, uh, the species uh, survived and coexisted at least to some level, perhaps not to the level that we would like. But it is a very, very difficult issue when you have a native species preying on on a species that is uh, imperiled. Mm -hmm. Hey, while we wait for more questions in the queue, let me let me ask this question. And I'll confess up front, uh, you know, I'm an attorney by training, but I find, Chris, when we're in California, when we're we're trying to forge these dialogue-based, sometimes safe harbor efforts between us, Fish and Wildlife Service or NIMS, and, and, and landowners, water users, as an example, we, we can structure an effort um, often you can find uh, consensus around this idea of metrics and objectives. You know, what are you seeking to manage towards uh, as an ability? And then you need common understanding or common science. Are you seeing anything develop around best practices or, or way to structure science at a habitat level? Are, are there regularly occurring unknown questions you think we're missing on research, on testing that slot into, you know, how we manage habitat, um, species. Um, Matt, if, if this strikes an accord for you in any sense around research needed in the field of invasives, what, what do you all think about advising, you know, the Western Governor's Initiative here on what we should be doing with limited dollars in the field of research, if you have any thoughts on that? Uh, this is Dave. I, I'd be glad to weigh in on that one. I, I think research is absolutely key, and, and that's why Trout Unlimited here in Wyoming has been dedicating uh, the funds that they have raised to to further the research into new methods of suppression um, and, and trying to understand fundamentally, uh, you know, how our invasive species is reproducing. Uh, where they're reproducing, and then how we might go about uh, trying to control that recruitment into the invasive population. Um, so I see science as a real key here, and, and I, I said earlier that we don't talk about eradication, we talk about suppression, but I think science uh, does give us the hope, at least, that in the future we may be able to talk about eradication of some of these species through some sort of genetic engineering, uh, we may be able to control a population, whether it's a lake trout or whether it's a zebra mussel or a quagga mussel or, or a brook trout or whatever. Uh, there are lots of studies underway in our university system that I think deserve support, and, and certainly we're doing that uh, in, in our area. Um, so I, I think research and science uh, holds the real keys to the long-term uh, solution to many of these issues. And Dave, what do you do? I'm sorry. Uh, Dave. Uh, Chris or Matt, your you might, your phone might have been a little garbled there. Were you trying to interject? Hey, Dave, take that a step farther. What do you what do you do? And there's this idea of a Hobbesian choice, which is you're stuck. It's a dilemma. You're stuck between really two bad options. So you're trying to manage something like, say, West Slope, Cutthroat, uh, you know, east of the divide in Montana, and mm -hmm. 
other things around hybridization, you know, with rainbows, and, you know, you might think that a tool is building a barrier to prevent, you know, uh, you know, hybridization between the two. And right. now, you know, I know this coming from having spent a lot of time with Trout Unlimited, you're running into stream connectivity issues, right, where a fundamental element of life for these species is the freedom to move, right? Absolutely, and it's a constant um, argument, if you will, um, between those two strategies because clearly uh, in many systems we're trying to remove barriers, um, typically man-made barriers that have uh, cut off the uh, the accessibility of a aquatic species, native aquatic species, to part of its habitat. And we spend untold uh, dollars uh, doing that, and that yet in other systems we create barriers to try and prevent and introduce non-native uh, salmonid from moving into the range of a native. And uh, uh, it's always a dilemma to, to uh, weigh those two goals and uh, we're sometimes divided even amongst uh, on an NGO like Trout Unlimited about the importance uh, or the, the relevance of constructing a barrier. So yeah, I think that's not a, an easy answer either. And this There's is another I can weigh in on that as well. Um, you know, even in, in some of our relatively speaking smaller stream systems, uh, we found it very useful to, to go in, you know, looking at, at one stream system that's, uh, you know, invaded with, with rainbow trout or, or brook trout. It would, looking into it, you know, at, at the beginning stages can seem, seem fairly daunting. Um, what we've done in the past is, is used a stepwise approach and we'll start at the top of the system. Um, we will construct a, a temporary management barrier and, and the key word there is, is temporary. Um, you construct a barrier, eradicate that upper end of the system, um, and and do it in, like I said, in a stepwise approach, moving moving down the system. And, and once the next section is done, you can remove that 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 temporary barrier, and and accomplish your your task in, in a series of, of steps as you start at the top of the system and move down. Um, that's been been very successful for us here in Nevada. Well, well, and I would agree with that. I think that's a great strategy where it can be done. Um, unfortunately, there are some systems that those uh, what might be considered temporary barriers become permanent uh, simply because the next reach downstream uh, just simply can't be rehabilitated adequately to uh, to to hold the native species. But uh, but no, it's a great strategy. Um, to do that in a stepwise fashion where it works. And this is Matt. I would say that we certainly need more research on controlling quagga zebras. Uh, Zequinox has shown some promise as being used in Southern California, but um, uh, it, it's not, uh, it's, it, anyway, it has, it, everything has drawbacks. But uh, I think that for aquatic weeds, biocontrols have shown some value and, and we should continue researching that. But I also wanted to just say again that um, watercraft inspection stations uh, are a valuable deterrent against all invasives, not just the uh, mussels, uh, because uh, it's, uh, anyway, I, I really think that uh, there's a tremendous cost-benefit analysis to prevention of these aquatics moving around our western U.S. And this is Chris. I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll second that and address one of the questions that, that I see there in queue, um, specifically about um, efforts that are being expended to prevent quaggas in, in Lake Tahoe. And, and the folks up there in the Lake Tahoe Basin uh, when, when quaggas were first discovered in the lower Colorado system, um, they were very proactive. They really got out ahead of it, um, spent a lot of money. They, I, I believe they realized uh, the effects that quaggas could have in a, in a pristine alpine lake like Lake Tahoe. Um, they recognized that early on, and they implemented some measures 
uh, to prevent the introduction of quaggas in Lake Tahoe and every boat entering the basin, every boat that, that will go on Lake Tahoe has to be inspected. Um, we do have a provision for a Tahoe only boat. So if that, if that boat only stays on Lake Tahoe and, and does not visit any other waters, um, there's a special tag that we use and that, that boat can only go on Tahoe and there's, there's a tag that, that, that connects the boat to the trailer. So if that tag is, is, is broken, that boat will need to be reinspected. But all boats going into Lake Tahoe, um, every last one of them does need to be inspected for, for invasive species. And another thing I wanted to go back on um, talking about the research question, uh, one thing that's been extremely beneficial for us in, in Mahant and Cutthroat Trout Recovery in Nevada is something that's just, it, it's fairly new, it's only been in practice for a couple years now, and that's uh, the use of eDNA e technology. Um, whereas, you know, it's not helpful in, in saying, okay, we don't have um, a species in this system. Um, we use it specifically for, for brook trout, the presence of brook trout in some of our lot and cutthroat trout waters. Um, you can't conclusively use eDNA to say um, brook trout are not there, uh, but it is extremely helpful in determining if they are there. If eDNA has, has been extremely useful in telling us, yes, there are brook trout still in this system. So um, from a research standpoint, that's, that's one of the latest innovations that uh, has been extremely helpful to us. I'm with you on that, Chris, particularly in this regard. So <clears throat> if one thinks out into the future, you think about landscape scale conservation, trying to structure it around imperiled species, and, you know, a best practice could be this idea of relationships with the regulated community, safe harbor, that kind of thing state federal cooperation, you're not going to know success unless you're monitoring something, right? Exactly. And then you back yourself into this problem of, well, who's got the assets available to really do the right monitoring program over time? Because, you know, this stuff doesn't change overnight. I, I'm very excited about the proposition that in the next couple of iterations, eDNA might be usable by us in management to, to really reduce the cost of some monitoring structure that'll help us know um, these recovery strategies work or not. Hey, so let me, watching the time, let me see if I can pivot. I know that we just had a few questions in, but we're at the moment where we need to wrap up. And I wanna give our panelists each a moment. So get ready here. Uh, this this works really hard. I my guess is everybody who's on this webinar right now, about 140 people maybe, probably share a value which is you're in this field, no matter location, because you're trying to pass on something in a no worse, you know, hopefully better shape to the next generation. This spirit of stewardship and it's hard, and it can wear you down. And I know there are days I kind of lose hope. So Dave, Matt, Chris, if y'all had just a, a word or two to pass on to the group around habitat, invasive species, broadly conservation within the context of the governor's initiative, what would you say? Would you say don't lose the faith, keep hope alive? I mean, how would you lead us off into the wrap up by Bill and staff with a couple of inspirational words you'd like to pass on to the group? I think I think what you just said is is uh, really beneficial. Don't lose hope when you, when we're looking at Lahontan and cutthroat trout recovery in Nevada. Uh, if you look back at that map, that currently occupied habitat versus historically what was once there, it seems um, really futile. Um, what are we doing? Are are we making a difference? But uh, if you go day by day and choose um, little pieces here and there. Um, I think it's beneficial um, to never give up the fight. Anything that you do towards recovery is going to help uh, in the future. So, yeah, I think that was a very, very advantageous comment. Well, Chuck, this is Dave. I, I think the, the word I would use is a word that I actually use quite a bit as I go around the, uh, the Rocky Mountain area talking about the situation in Yellowstone. 
Park, um, I remind my audiences every time that I talk with them to find their passion uh, when it comes to native species conservation. Um, passion, I think, is a key, especially for those of us who are not professionals in the field. Uh, we're volunteers. We, we love the resource, um, whether it's because we angle for them or because we enjoy the ecosystem that it supports. But passion, I think, is, is the word. And find your own passion when it comes to these native species. Thanks, Dave. Matt, you get last word, and then we'll flip it back to Zach and Bill. Okay, thanks, uh, Chuck. My my word would be uh, we lack the institutional frameworks. Um, we need to build long-term, regional, multi-state, sustainable institutional partnerships to address on an ecosystem-based approach uh, invasives. And uh, we need a lot of help on that. We need to think institutionally and create something that we don't have today. Great. Hey, so it was a real pleasure to do this, and uh, I appreciate Governor Meade launching the effort, like I said, to, to begin with. In my view, the act, the act worked well, works well, but of course it can also work better, and I'm hopeful this workshop illustrated some ways it both works well and can work better. So, Bill, you want to take us home from there? Thanks, Chuck. Um, Again, this is Zach Bodin with Western Governors Association, and just on behalf of WG, I really want to thank everyone for attending the second webinar uh, in our series as part of the Western Governors Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act Initiative. I really want to thank everyone for the insightful discussion. It's, it's been great to sit back and listen to. Uh, please keep a lookout for a wrap-up email that will come later this week or early next week with a link to the webinar recording up on our YouTube page and a summary of the key discussion points brought up today. In addition to that, uh, please be sure to check out our online resource library at westgov.org. There you can find some case studies, best practices, and resources highlighted as a part of this initiative. The webinar will also be posted online on our website. And with that, thank you all, and I hope to see everyone at our next webinar on February 25th, the subject of which will be the role of conflict and litigation in the ESA. Thank you all.